um, there was such a thing called shamanism. And shamanism was the first mm, theme or, or broad subject matter that helped me to make sense of my own experience. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, not only do people all around the world have these kind of experiences, but they've been having them forever. They're not even particularly strange or special. They're just part of our human existence. And it sounds so. like it was a real wake-up call. And, yeah. and it's amazing. When I was in a Zen monastery in Korea, one uh, master told me, you need to die to your life before you die. So it's very strange in the um, clear, uh, vicinity of death. Many people wake up. What do you exactly mean by that? Right. Great questions, Renan. <laughs> Wonderful. So ancient understanding, you know, our, our ancestors knew all about the cycles of life. The original shamans were the original systems thinkers. They were the original ecologists. They understood our place as humans in the the bigger web of life. They had a direct sense of that through their visions, through their understanding, through their place in their community. And their, the place of the shaman in, in community was all about um, initiation, marking moments of change individually, but also in the community, like when the season changes, when the moon changes, when, when, um, when the hunt is coming, all of these very day-to-day -day, uh, important activities. They, they created spaces which were storytelling, which were dance, which were theater, which were healing, which were collective, which were individual, where we remembered our individual connection to the bigger picture of life. So they, those ceremonies place the individual back in the context of we, of us, of life as a whole and our place in it and our role in it. And in the modern world, you know, we've become very individualized, very focused on the self. And I don't think that's a bad thing as a, as a process of evolution, not at all. I think... Um, a lot of those ancient communities were very, they were full of taboos and full of shoulds and shouldn'ts. And the idea of personal freedom that you could choose your own partner or choose your own work or choose your own place to live or that just didn't exist. There was a, there was quite rigid structures. So the individual kind of broke out of that. And then we kind of swung over to that side of the pendulum and you know, I think our modern challenge is how to be self connected to us, to we, to this. And so to be um, what one of our teachers called the tribal individual. To return home, that I've been unable to stop and feel each step in the very heartbeat of the land. When I arrived here seven years ago, I thought I knew how to slow down. Well, I didn't. And I couldn't feel or hear the gods until I confronted my fear of stillness. That very stillness the rest of the world would harshly call death. Yes. Have you ever noticed animal behavior? The first time I approached a reindeer in the wilds seven years ago, it sensed my presence and it immediately froze. It stopped moving completely. This is something called death mimicry dead or lifeless things don't move. This is clearly a tactic to escape becoming a meal. But what is really important is that the message it conveys is still.
illness. Uh, I got uh, very soon uh, to understand the principal method of calming the mind in order to become still was not simply by shutting down my thoughts and mimicking the reindeer behavior, but becoming closer to being one a reindeer. These days it seems as if everything in the way we choose to live takes us away from ourselves. Each and every day something gets taken away, and away, and away. The constant distractions being too busy, noises, stress, emotions, stimulating foods and drinks, ideals, beliefs, protective mechanisms, anxiety, you name it. And this way of life then becomes our daily lived experience which we perceive as normal when it is not and we allow it to to perpetuate, we forge ahead with the power of a tsunami. This is utterly exhausting. But In terms of modern understanding of how change happens, we, we've learned a lot recently about the nervous system and the effect of different things on our nervous system the effect of the past on our present experience the effect of um how we are taught to concentrate or learn which puts us on high alert which makes it much more difficult for us to learn anything if we're on very very high alert or we feel threatened or we're worried about getting it wrong and I know you know that because I, I, I was blessed to come to one of your workshops one time. And I love that spaciousness of like, if you're finding it hard, lie down on the floor a while, rest, then come back, start again at the basic. And that sense of we have to be able or willing to make mistakes in order mm -hmm. to learn, which is so different than the kind of education I grew up in. So we're learning about acceptance and safety as well as intention and dedication and commitment and how the brain works when we feel under threat and you know even as much as our our capacity to hear closes down the muscles in our ears contract when we feel under threat so these understandings have helped us to create modern forms that are that answer that ancient need for community for ritual for belonging for initiation alongside these modern neuroscientific understandings of the brain and neural pathways and how to root change in the system okay but still the stillness is always there and it's so needed longed for and worth reconnecting to it is uh, the depth of the ocean unaffected by its waves but still full of life and presence this means stillness is not something we have to go in search of nor a journey into escapism or numbness it is where we come from and what we are innately made of it is our natural state of being you see, stillness is a choice, and the gods flow with a simple rhythm, the rhythm of stillness.